Good evening, everyone. My name is Ben, and I'm here from the Hospital Research Foundation Group Arthritis, or Arthritis SA. And I'm very happy to welcome you to our webinar this month. Uh, we've called it Gout Q&A with Dr. David Bersil, and um, we're very lucky to have him along with us today. First and foremost, I'd like to do an acknowledgement of country. Both David and myself present from Ghana land today, and we pay our respects to elders past, present, and future. This webinar was also made possible through the funding from the Country South Australia Primary Health Network, and we thank them very much for making it possible. Now, I'd like to raise first and foremost that our questions and answers is open for the entire presentation. Um, so they will be presenting for a little bit of time. So if you've got any questions that kind of come up, please just submit them at any part and we'll answer them all at the end. To introduce David or Dr. David Versil, um, he's a consulting rheumatologist at the Royal Adelaide Hospital and also works privately. He's got over two decades of clinical experience in the medical field, and he's actively involved in research, particularly in gout, as well as other forms of arthritis. Uh, David, I'll hand over to you. Thanks very much, and uh, thank you for the introduction. And I'd probably just like to add uh, to that as well. In, in my work at the Rod Adelaide Hospital, I, I run a gout research clinic um, on one day of the week. So I, I do have a particular interest in this area. So um, in this talk today, just as an overview, um, I want to, first of all, give you a little bit of a background of what gout is um, and sort of explore, you know, how common is gout, um, what are the causes, um, what can it cause uh, in, in patients who have gout, what sort of manifestations does it have, symptoms and signs and um, how do we go about diagnosing it um, and how we manage it? And I'm sure a lot of people um, out there have questions about, you know, do I manage this by strictly dietary changes or lifestyle changes? Um, or is this a medication-based uh, uh, management approach? Or is it a combination of both of those things? And of course, if we're going to use medications, what are some of the common side effects of those medications or potential side effects? And can I ever really get rid of, uh, of gout or is it something where I'm stuck with for life and, and what sort of follow-up do I require? So um, I like history and gout has a particularly rich and interesting history. So if you indulge me just briefly, I, I don't want to get too far off track about this, but I think it's uh, helpful to know the sort of background as to um, where we are um, in our understanding of gout. So the history of gout actually goes back to the Cretaceous period, believe it or not. There are some uh, um, uh, fossilized remains of dinosaurs, including uh, of a Tyrannosaurus rex, which was reported in uh, a Nature Journal article going back some time ago now. Um, gout can actually cause erosions of the bone, as we uh, will talk about later. And they found that fossilized remains of this Tyrannosaurus rex actually showed characteristic uh, gouty bone erosions. And in fact, uh, the Egyptians in the sort of third millennium um, BC also were aware of the presence of gout. So they described what we now refer to as pedagra. Pedagra is the often the first manifestation of gout, acute inflammation of the, the big toe. Uh, the, the word pedagra itself is quite ancient, which means foot trap, because people didn't really understand what was actually going on at the time, as we now do. Uh, ancient Egyptians uh, mummified remains actually showed evidence of gouty bone erosions as well. Um, the first sort of uh, uh, intelligent descriptions of uh, of what what gout actually is and and the sort of I guess if you like the epidemiology of gout were actually described by Hippocrates. He wrote uh, a number of aphorisms which we're going to look briefly at in a moment in the in um, around about 400 BC. Um, and these are sort of general comments about the nature of gout, which actually very much hold true today. Sort of moving more closely to the, to, not really to the present time, but there was a famous physician um, by the name of Claudius Galen. And this, uh, this physician, his works sort of remained popular um, all the way up to the Middle Ages. And he was famous because of his... Um, uh, his interest in actually uh, dissection, and he he uh, described the appearance of what we now call a gouty tophi, which are large collections of crystals in the tissue. And he also 
uh, propose that in some cases gout can be a hereditary condition, which is certainly the case. This gentleman with the bad moustache and, and, and the wig, um, Van Leeuwenhoek, um, was, uh, was a Dutch uh, pioneer in, in the field of um, microscopy. And so he was one of the first to describe the appearance of things like bacteria and protozoa under the microscope. He also described the appearance of gout crystals, these sort of these quite distinctly shaped crystals that we'll, we'll have a look at a picture of uh, later. Um, and this gentleman, um, Carl Scheel, um, he was a Swedish um, biochemist. He's actually credited as being the co-discoverer of oxygen, but one of his other discoveries um, include a number of uh, organic acids, including urate, which is the prerequisite uh, for the formation of gout crystals and the condition of gout. And things really started to move in the, in, in the field of gout uh, with Alfred uh, Garod. So this gentleman, he, discovered, he actually... He invented this test called the thread test. It was uh, what we is actually the first semi-quantitative test. So it was uh, a first for not just gout, but laboratory testing. And what he was able to do with that was to show that patients with gout actually had a relatively higher concentration of urate in their blood uh, compared to patients with rheumatoid arthritis. Because at the time, uh, us rheumatologists, primitive rheumatologists at that time, was sort of uh, thinking that they were both the same disease, but it's sort of like a, a spectrum of different forms of arthritis under the same umbrella. Uh, this gentleman, Wilhelm uh, Hiss, actually then injected some of those urate crystals into rabbits, unfortunate for them, and that caused the sort of inflammation that we often see with gout flares. And then his protege, uh, Max Freudweiler, actually did the same thing to humans, which again, even more unfortunate for them. And this is 60 years ago now, um, but um, McCarty and Hollander were the, were, the, were, were the individuals that actually uh, uh, pioneered the use of polarised mi light microscopy. So this is the way we make a definitive diagnosis of gout now is that if we can access a joint, if we can put a needle in, get some fluid out, send it off to the laboratory, we use polarised light microscopy to show these characteristic crystals. So... All of that is to say that um, gout has an extremely long and interesting history. And in fact, we know a lot about it. Um, so it is in fact the most common inflammatory arthritis. So it's far more common than rheumatoid arthritis. And if you look in uh, papers, they sort of quote anywhere from three to 6% in men, one to 2% in women. But if you look at the sort of local data, you see that those numbers are in fact higher up somewhere between sort of five and 7% with men up to sort of eight and a half percent. So almost one in 10 men lifetime, which is very high. Um, just coming back to Hippocrates for a moment. <laughs> um, so these aphorisms that were attributed to him, I'm sure they didn't all um, uh, come from Hippocrates, but it, it gives us some idea about the sort of people that get gout. <laughs> So the first sort of, sort of three aphorisms he mentions here have to do with hormonal influences, which is uh, which holds up to be entirely true with what we know now. So he mentions there that eunuchs don't get gout, and they also don't get bold like me. Um, that that women don't get gout uh, until they're postmenopausal, um, and that uh, men have an increased risk of gout once they hit puberty. Now all of that is very much true. Uh, he also goes on to say that sort of the gout flares that we know um, are episodic. They, they tend to go away no matter what we do, um, although you know, 40 days is a bit of a long flare. Um, and he also goes on to add something about the seasonal variation in the, in, in the incidence of gout flares, which um, there is some developing evidence to suggest he was correct on that as well. So Hippocrates saw a lot of patients with gout and he made some very astute observations. So uh, we know that as we get older, um, uh, gout is more common. We know that there is hormonal influence. And, and this has got to do with the level of urate in the blood. And it is an elevated urate level in the blood, which is the prerequisite for um, forming the crystals which lead to gout. So the urate level rises in puberty, as I said before, and after, uh, in males and in, after menopause in women. And so the average age of onset is in sort of uh, midlife for uh, men and older in women. And it seems like the prevalence of gout is increasing for whatever reason. It might be to do with lifestyle changes. It might be, be to do, do with the aging population. 
the increased incidence of certain medications which can predispose to a high urate level. And there are a number of important um, uh, other medical conditions which can be associated with gout. That's not to say that they necessarily cause them, although certainly, as we'll discuss later, people with kidney disease have an increased risk of, um, there's a certainly direct causal mechanism there in terms of increasing their risk of, of gout. But it's sort of, you know, a lot of these other diseases occur in clusters and it's important to acknowledge these and the medications that we use and some of the side effects of those. So. To summarize, gout is caused by a high urate level, and we call this hyperuricemia. Um, and that leads to the formation of crystals, and that can be both in and around the joints. So it can also be in things like tendons and soft tissues and stuff like that. Um, the important concentration, and this sounds awfully technical, but people with gout will remember these numbers because um, people like me keep on parroting so the urate concentrations back at them all the time. And they, um, but that concentration of urate in the blood has to be at least 0 0.40. And effectively then um, the blood can become concentrated with urate to the point where crystals can form. However, people can walk around with urate levels of 0 0.60 and never have any symptoms or signs or features of gout ever. So there are clearly some individual factors in who gets crystals and how they respond to the presence of these, the, those crystals. But in general, the higher that urate level goes, the more likely you are to get gout. So what can cause gout? And I'm sure you've all got some ideas about what might contribute to gout because it's uh, it's kind of like something that's, uh, gout's got a bad reputation. <laughs> People don't like to be diagnosed with it because it's got all these connotations, which aren't necessarily true, which I hope you'll realize by the end of this presentation. But urate can be overproduced in the body. There are certain diseases. In fact, there's a lot of diseases that can do that. I'm not going to go into those because it gets awfully complicated quickly. But I guess some of the more common things are that, um, you know, if you periods of stress for the body, and that might be any other illness like a heart attack or a stroke or something like that, can certainly lead to an elevated urate and, and, uh, and a gout flare, for example. There are also some types of cancers, for example, where the, the, the body cells are turning over faster and there's a high urate level in the blood. Um, we all know about the dietary intake stuff, and I'm going to go over this in, in a sec, but I also don't want people to get sort of too hung up on it because uh, most of the patients with gout that I see don't actually fit the stereotypical image of, of uh, what people perceive as a, a gout patient. Um, but at the other end of the equation, if it's not being overproduced, it might be under excreted. In other words, it might be um, being eliminated from the body at a less fast rate than the average person. Now, the kidneys are largely responsible for getting um, urate out the body. So they're very important in, in filtering out urate, if you like. Uh, also, lesser known source of getting it out of your body is through your bowels. Um, all right. So the dietary stuff. So certainly foods that are high in what we call purines, which then gets broken down into urate um, can contribute to risk of gout. So some of those things are shellfish in particular, red meat, and in particular, organ meat. Now that's not to say that you can't have red meat. Um, I think, you know, it's those sorts of things are important for a balanced diet, but, you know, if someone's sort of uh, eating those things, uh, you know, seven nights a week, that might be something you want to look at in the diet. Likewise, sweet and soft drinks are a problem. Uh, so fructose through a rather complex mechanism in um, affecting uh, metabolism in the, in, in the liver can actually lead to high urate levels as well. Um, alcohol is the one that everyone knows about when it comes to risk of gout. Uh, and it can happen via a couple of mechanism, mechanisms. So alcohol obviously um, will inflame the liver and that will cause turnover of the liver, liver cells rather, and that will actually produce more urate. Um, beer um, sort of gets you twice because it, beer in itself is high in purines as well. So it causes the inflammation of the liver and it also um, uh, provides more purines that then get metabolized to urate. There are actually some uh, things that you can eat or drink that can reduce urate levels in certain studies. So low-fat dairy products, uh, cherries, uh, heavy, heavy caffeine consumption, which they define as five cups a day, uh, 
which I thought was pretty lightweight anyway, but they, they have the potential to um, reduce um, your euro level. So diet is important. And um, I think that certainly is part of treatment, um, but it's not the entire picture. And people need to realize that this is actually an inflammatory arthritis and they're a very good medication to help them. Um, so in fact, a more, rather than diet, a more common cause of, the most common cause of gout rather is reduced excretion of urate. So as mentioned before, the majority of urate leaves the body via the kidneys. And so certainly I see a lot of patients with chronic kidney disease um, and uh, they've lost that, um, you know, 100% of the urate in the body is initially filtered out through the kidney and then there's complex reabsorption and uh, within the actual uh, kidneys themselves. But the reality is if you're not filtering um, the urate out as well as you should through your kidneys, then you're at increased risk of developing gout. There are also some medications taken for certain medical conditions that can contribute to um, uh, retention of urate through the kidneys. And that includes, surprisingly, uh, low-dose aspirin and, uh, uh, and also commonly used uh, diuretic medications as well, either diuretics for fluid retention or diuretics as part of uh, uh, blood pressure medication. Um, and uh, in some cases, like this uh, uh, mosaic of ancient Romans shows, uh, it can be due to toxins such as lead, and this is something called, we call satinine uh, gout, but it's fortunately not very common these days. So there are four sort of distinct problems that having gout can cause for people afflicted with it. Uh, the most commonly known, of course, is the dramatic gout flares where you get this acute inflammatory arthritis. Some people who have accumulated a lot of crystals get these, what we call subcutaneous tophi, which are these collections of, of, of crystals that we can see and, and feel on examination. I'll show you a few pictures of those. Um, less commonly known um, is what we call chronic gouty arthritis. So this is some. Um, if you look at sort of uh, the presence of the crystals in the joint um, and you have this sort of uh, the levels of inflammation over time. Now, during a flare, that level of inflammation goes very high um, and that's what we call a gout flare. But that doesn't last particularly long and most flares will resolve within a couple of weeks. However, sometimes having those crystals still sitting there causes this more grumbling, lower grade inflammation. And that's what we call chronic gouty arthritis. And I'll show you the consequences of that uh, in a moment as well. Now, the bit that uh, worries me in patients who have gout, though, is actually gouty bone erosion. So sort of harking back to that uh, case of the Tyrannosaurus rex with the gouty bone erosions, if you've got inflammation um, in uh, and around your joints, and the consequence of that is that inflammation can actually damage uh, the joint itself. And sometimes it can substantially damage the joint. So this is a picture of what we call pedagra, or as I said before, a foot trap, so acute inflammation. This is often the, the very, um, uh, uh, this is the most common presentation of, of gout involving the first, um, what we call metatarsophalangeal joint of the big toe. Um, most gout flares are in a single joint, um, but in fact, uh, multiple joints can be involved during flare, we call it a polyarticular flare, and just about any joint can be involved. There are plenty of um, reports in the literature about people who actually have flares in their spine, um, but it can involve tendons and the bursts of those fluid-filled sacs that surround the joints as well. These tend to be fairly dramatic in onset. A lot of people report that they sort of wake up in the early hours of the morning with this sort of scratch, scratchy feeling of their joint, which quickly sort of blows up into acute inflammation. The pain is often described as 11 out of 10. Uh, you wouldn't believe how many people independently tell me that it's so painful that they can't have a sheet on their toe. I call it a positive sheet sign. I don't even ask them. They just volunteer that information. Uh, the, the joint will be very tender to touch, warm, and often will have skin changes as shown in the picture with this sort of redness over the joint. They typically though resolve even without treatment within a period of two weeks. Um, and in between those, as I said before, are 
uh, these asymptomatic periods where the joint doesn't appear to be inflamed, but it might just sort of be uh, inflama have inflammation at, at, at a lower grade. Now, I apologize for some of the gruesome pictures I'm about to show, but um, these are pretty bad cases of, of, of gout. So th these are the subcutaneous trophy. You'll see these large deposits of crystals around the joint, and this is a particularly severe example. Um, this is someone's elbow. This is a common site where um, TOFI develop as well. You see these sort of lumps under the surface. And if you sort of blanch the skin slightly, they, they've got this sort of uh, yellowish white appearance. These are some terrible uh, um, subcutaneous TOFI of the hands of this gentleman. And this is one of the largest toe I've ever seen involving someone's finger. This subsequently had to be amputated because it became infected. And that's one of the complications that can occur with this toe fire. You can see this is very red and inflamed. It's got a small ulcer over it. Um, and, um, you know, this sort of failed to respond to antibiotics um, and subsequently had to be removed. Now, I spoke before about the sort of chronic gouty arthritis, which is more lower grade inflammation. You can see in this picture, the right hand, it's got that puffy appearance compared to the left. Um, and really chronic gouty arthritis can masquerade as sort of a rheumatoid arthritis type presentation. So if we look at these pictures here, these are all hands of people with, um, uh, with gout. And if you didn't know that, you would look at these and say, this person has rheumatoid arthritis. So it can, can cause over the years some fairly significant deforming changes in the hands. You can see on the lower uh, right-hand side, this poor hand closure of, as a result of the deforming changes that, it, that occurs. So it's a very erosive, damaging disease. And these erosions often aren't evident. And for whatever reason, doctors often don't x-ray the hands and feet of people with gout. They do it all the time for rheumatoid arthritis and other stuff, but they don't seem to grasp the significance of um, x-rays in gout. So if we look at the x-ray of this person, you'll see that ring finger that looks swollen. Um, and I've given you a positive uh, red circle sign here, but you can see that joint there has been really completely destroyed. Um, and this is just some horrendous erosions. I won't dwell on them too long, but suffice to say that a lot of these uh, people have some of the most horrific erosions that if they occurred in someone with rheumatoid arthritis, we'd all sort of hang our heads in shame. So unfortunately, these are people that have come to me sort of many decades down the track. It's caused extensive damage to their joints. And this is all preventable. So... How do we diagnose gout? A lot of it's clinical. Obviously, if someone turns up and they've got these subcutaneous toe fire everywhere, then nothing else presents like that. that that's gout from the other side of the room. Um, one or the other, uh, is some, if someone has these episodes of acute inflammatory arthritis that seem to come, uh, come and go, then we have a look at their blood test. So obviously, we want to know what their urate level is. And as I said before, it only has to be over 0 0.40. If you look at normal reference ranges reported by laboratories, sometimes they'll say that normal, the normal range actually includes over 0 0.40, but what they're really reporting is an average range for the population. And so it doesn't have to be very high at all. Um, so anything over 0 0.40 can potentially um, lead to uh, gout. Now, during a flare, when someone has a good going flare, they're, they have very elevated markers of inflammation on their blood tests. It's almost as though they've got an infection of the joint. It's very high. And of course, as I've shown you on x-rays, uh, 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 we can see the changes of gout if it's caused erosions. Ultrasound can be very sensitive at looking at deposits of crystals um, in the right hands. There's, special light, there's a special sort of CT scan called a dual energy CT scan. I'm not going to go into that in any further detail today, but that, that can actually look for deposits of urate as well. But the definitive diagnosis, if you're uncertain, is to actually put a needle into the joint and suck out some fluid, send it off the laboratory and have a look at those crystals, which look actually look quite beautiful, but they're nasty. <laughs> That's what they look like. All right, so just moving on to treatment now. Treatment, I divide up into three different things. So the first thing is, how do you deal with the flare? Because that's the thing that people, when they first come to my attention, that's what they want to know. Um, because they're obviously having 11 out of 10 pain in their joint, which is swollen and red. 
So there are a number of options for this. Now, the most common one is using anti-inflammatories, which you can just get across the counter, of course, things like Nurofen, Voltaren. Um, there is also um, a similar medication they're called COX-2 inhibitors. People might have heard of stuff like Celebrex or Celcoxib is its real name. Um, prednisolone is commonly used, which is an anti-inflammatory steroid tablet. A very ancient medication called colchicine, which has been around since the time of the ancient Greeks, um, can also be used to uh, treat a flare. Or more directly, um, someone can actually put a needle in and put some cortisone sort of directly into the joint, and that can often be the fastest way of resolving a flare. That's not really practical, though, if someone has what we call a polyarticular flare when they've got multiple joints involved. What I would stress, though, is that whatever you're going to do, treating early is the most important thing. So people who have gout, once they've proved this for themselves, are actually really sold on the idea. If you sort of watch it for even sort of 48 hours, it tends to develop what I call some momentum, and then it can be much harder to treat. I um, uh, prefer uh, patients that if they think that they have you know, a good idea that they're developing a flare, and whether that's three o'clock in the morning or whether they're walking down the road, that's when they should treat themselves. Because the sooner you start treatment, the sooner it aborts the flare. All right, so what are some of the potential side effects of these medications? And I think this is important. So certainly the anti-inflammatories and Celebrex, they have, they're very commonly used. And also they, they, they head the sort of list of most common side effects from medications year in, year out, because a lot of people use them. Um, there are some uh, medical conditions which they can make worse. So they commonly can contribute to reflux and things like stomach ulcers. And they can also contribute uh, or worsen things like heart failure. They can also interact with certain blood pressure medications and that and, and they can actually affect the kidney function as well. So you really got to choose these medications carefully based on what other medical conditions that patient has. So for example, if someone's got chronic kidney disease, I'm not going to give them an anti-inflammatory because their nephrologist will be very, very upset with me. Um, I often use a fair bit of prednisolone um, for treating uh, flares. Uh, prednisolone can have some horrendous side effects when it's used in large doses for long periods of time. Um, but when we're treating gout, we, and if you treat early, you don't really need a very large dose, and it doesn't typically need to be treated for very long either, so that's entirely safe for most people. But you know, when it's used in large doses and for longer periods of time, it can affect things like blood sugars, it can put on weight, um, et cetera. So, but we don't use it in, in that, sort of, that sort of way. It's used just for a short sort of uh, a period of time. So that's a basic overview of how we treat flares. The most important thing, however, and, and the problem with gout treatment in general in the community is the focus is largely on just treating flares and then that patient often just disappears and then you come back to their, their local doctor when they have another flare. And really, as you'd appreciate now, um, their urate level is still elevated and they still have crystals in and around their joints and nothing has really changed. Um, in the interim, they've still got those crystals sitting there and they've got inflammation grumbling away. So the most important element of treatment is in fact, lowering the urate level and dissolving the crystals. Now in Australia, we only have three medications for that purpose, which is a bit dismal, but fortunately um, the first one is good enough for 95% of cases. So we, we usually get there. Um, allopurinol is the most commonly used medication, goes by other names, the most common is Progout, it's also known as Xyloprim or Alicig. Um, and uh, a more uh, recent development is something called, for, uh, been around for a while now, but for Buxostat, also known as Adneric. Now, these two medications actually reduce the rate at which urate is produced. So they work from the top end. There's one more medication. Uh, and this is a medication that helps uh, the kidneys excrete the urate. So it works at the bottom end. And we only have one medication for that. And it's called Prevenicid, also known as Procid. So allopurinol. Allopurinol has been around forever, almost 60 years now. And so you've got to ask, why aren't we using it correctly still? It was subject, amongst other things, of the Nobel Prize. 
um, and it's generally considered first line treatment. It's a once daily dose, which makes it convenient. And so people don't forget it. They just take it in the morning. Um, I think it's important to realize that in actual fact, allopurinol doesn't last in the system very long. It gets metabolized to something called oxypurinol. And the reason why I mentioned that is that oxypurinol uh, lasts for around about 15 hours in the system for someone who has normal kidneys. But if you have a degree of kidney failure, then it starts to hang around longer. And in fact, people with significant kidney failure can hang around for well over a day. And that needs to be taken into account when it's being dosed. It comes in two strengths. I don't know how they came to this, but a 100 and a 300. Um, and what we will typically do is start it at a low dose. It's not going to be enough to reduce the urate level to the point where we want it to be. Um, but there's a reason for that. So we usually start at just 100 milligrams a day. And because of the fact it's metabolized to so that oxypurinol, as I just mentioned, which accumulates in kidney failure, we'd usually use an even lower dose than someone who has kidney failure. We might start it at 50 milligrams a day, so half of a 100 milligram tablet, or in some cases it might be every second day. And then we just very slowly increase it because we don't need to get there in a hurry. So you shouldn't be in the dose shouldn't be increased any more than every two to four weeks. And what we're trying to do is gradually bring down the urate to what we call um, serum urate target. In other words, we're trying to get it at a level below the point where the crystals can form. So as I said before, that number of 0 0.40, we want to get it below that. So the target's really arbitrary and guidelines say different things. They say at least lower than 0.36. I choose 0 0.30 because my experience and with the research that I've done you know, and following patients with ultrasound studies and things like that, um, you might be there forever and a day if you, if you choose that higher target. So in other words, we're getting the concentration down to a suitable level where the crystals are going to dissolve not too fast. And there's a reason for that, um, but also not so slow that it's going to take the next 10 years. The dose of allopurinol, um, and this rarely happens, can, but can go all the way up to 900 milligrams a day. One of the main problems is, of course, when people get started on allopurinol, well, first of all, the problem is people getting started on allopurinol in the first place. But the second problem is that people don't, uh, doctors don't then sequentially measure what the concentration is and increase the dose appropriately. So uh, you'll often see that people are started on either 100 or 300, and they stay on that. <laughs> regardless of what it's doing for them. And it might bring down the urate level, but it might never be below 0 0.40. And therefore, you know, they're, they're still going to accumulate crystals and their gout's going to get worse. So does allopurinol have any side effects? Very rarely, very rarely. So like anything, you can have an allergic type reaction, just like you can to things like penicillin. We call this allopurinol hypersensitivity syndrome. I haven't seen this full-blown syndrome in anyone uh, so far that's come through my clinic, um, uh, but it's very rare. Um, and it's something that usually happens in the early going in the first two to three months. It's characterized usually by a rash. Um, and I tell my patients if they get a new onset of a rash when starting allopurinol there to stop it and immediately let me know. Um, but it can be even life-threatening and uh, affect the internal organs. That's extraordinarily rare. Um, and the reason for that, uh, and it's getting, becoming sort of increasingly rare as well, because uh, in times past, we often, uh, not myself, but rheumatologists in general, or doctors in general, started on a, a higher dose of allopurinol, thinking that well, we need to you know, put someone on a higher dose to bring the urate level down. So it appears that our approach, a uh, more modern approach, of starting off on a low dose and then gradually increasing it reduces that risk. Um, also, there are some um, genetic predispositions that we can test for in certain patient groups. Um, and that's a specialized test, but it can be done. And that would tell us if someone was positive for that certain marker, that we would actually start them on a different um, medication. And as I said before, I, I just generally tell people if they get a rash, that's when they stop it. But the more common side effect, if you like, um, which is not really a side effect, is that people can get more flares um, in the short term on starting or increasing the allopurinol dose, which sounds like it's doing the opposite to what you want it to do. And this is obviously a cause of 
um, poor compliance in patients because they're really not expecting it because they're often not told this is going this potentially can happen. But the idea is that if you're lowering the urate and you're dissolving the crystals, you're starting to mobilize them again. And in fact, that sort of uh, upsets the immune system to a certain extent. And they'll, they, if you sort of visualize these crystals as nicely stored in your tissues between flares, as they start to break up, you can actually get more flares in the short term. Um, and that's actually a sign that it's working. Now, there are ways around stopping that from becoming an unpleasant ex experience, which I'll go through. Um, but there is always that potential and you need to let people know when you start uh, them on these medications that in the short term, you can get more flares. And that's not a reason uh, uh, to consider it a failure of treatment. It just means that we need to adopt other approaches to make um, to try and reduce the chance of having flares. And eventually the flares will then peter out and eventually go away completely over time. The other uh, medication I'll just mention uh, briefly that reduces the production of urate was for Buxostat or Admuric. Um, it has a disadvantage that it only comes in one tablet strength, so it makes it hard to titrate. And as I've just said, you know, if you drop the urate level precipitously, then you have this risk of flares, which often can be a problem with for Buxostat. I mean, you can half the tablet, but 40 milligrams still drops the urate level quite significantly. And we can go all the way up to one and a half tablets, but that's about it. But most people don't need any more than that. So this is something that we might use if someone's developed a rash with allopurinol. We don't want to push it any further in case they become sick and we change them over to Fibaxistat. Uh, finally, in terms of the urate lowering therapy, uh, probenicid um, is the one that helps you pee out more of the urate. Um, uh, it's uh, not, it could very well be considered a first line treatment. Uh, it's not, however, because it's a twice uh, daily dosing and it doesn't matter who you are, you're going to start forgetting that evening dose in a lot of cases. Um, but it's a very good medication. Uh, it comes in one strength. It's usually started at half a tablet twice a day and you can go all the way up to two tablets in the morning, two tablets at night. One contraindication is if you've had a history of kidney stones because some people with gout can get uric acid stones um, in, in the kidneys, which obviously can be quite an unpleasant experience. Um, and so if that's you and your doctor should ask you first, then you shouldn't be taking probenicid. Finally, um, I just like in terms of treatment, I'd like to talk about gout flare prophylaxis. So this is preventing flares from occurring in the first place. So as I said before, when you start this urate lowering therapy, most commonly allopurinol, you do have this increased risk of flares uh, in the short term. Now we can reduce that by just going up very slowly with the allopurinol dose. Um, but there are also some other medications that we can use in the short term to reduce the risk of flares. Now, this is often colchicine. Now, whilst I said before that colchicine is this um, ancient medication that can be used to treat flares, I often don't give it for that because it, uh, the reason the ancient Greeks use it was as a purgative. So it can give you diarrhea. So it can be an unpleasant experience. But taking either you know, one or maybe um, uh, one tablet a day or one tablet twice a day um, can actually help reduce the risk of flares occurring in the first place. Um, now, uh, rarely we would use something like a low dose of prednisolone or anti-inflammatories, but a lot of the time that can cause toxicity over a period of time. So if I'm using gout flare prophylaxis, I'm usually using colchicine. Um, but I don't want it to be forever. And this is another problem um, that we experience sometimes with gout management is sometimes people get started on this, this chronic dose of colchicine, one or two tablets a day, and they're just left on it. Um, they're not started on allopurinol to actually solve their gout. They're just left on this. And yes, it does reduce the frequency of their gout flares, but you know the, the problem is just uh, keeps going. So that period of time is often sort of three, six, maybe up to nine months. It really depends on the individual. Someone who has terrible TOFI, like some of the pictures we saw before, they've got a lot of gout crystals in their body. And I'm almost always will make sure that they have colchicine prophylaxis because as they dissolve all these crystals, they're likely to get into strife with some flares in the, in, in the early going. So how are we doing with gout um, as doctors? Um, so as I mentioned before, we're not really doing that well as, as a group. So allopurinol is often under-prescribed. So we're not giving 
enough patients with gout, allopurinol. Um, as well, it's not often dosed appropriately. So it's not increased to the right um, uh, dose to get that urate level concentration down and the crystals dissolving at an appropriate rate. And also it's not monitored particularly well. So people aren't having regular monitoring blood tests to see what their urate level is, to see in fact, um, have we got the dose right? Are we fixing the problem? As I said before as well, there's this focus on, uh, on really managing the gout flares rather than the long-term treatment of gout. And I guess in a, in a way that's understandable because they're so dramatic. Um, and when they settle down, people are just happy that they've gone, but they're going to come back unless something is done about them in the long term. Um, uh, Colchicine is often inappropriately uh, prescribed. It's just uh, continued um, uh, without allopurinol, as I've already mentioned. Uh, a fairly recent um, a South Australian study showed that less than 40% of people who have uh, gout are actually being have actually been prescribed allopurinol, which is pretty poor. If you were to say that you, you, you know, you surveyed all the type 2 diabetics in the state and less than 40% of them were on treatment for that, that would be um, pretty dismal. So there are some challenges to the treatment of gout. Um, and uh, one of them is actually the name itself. <laughs> Um, telling people that they have gout sometimes, you can see them screwing up the face immediately. It's not a very welcome diagnosis because of the implications that it has, I guess the connotations that it has. Um, but as I said, most, most people, it's really due to their other medical conditions, sometimes their medications. And that's not to suggest that they should go out and stop all those medications. They started for a good reason, but people need to understand that it's not always something that they brought upon themselves. It's a common inflammatory arthritis. Um, and again, this misunderstanding that, that gout is just a, a coming and going disease of acute inflammation, but it should be seen as a chronic disease, uh, a crystal arthritis caused by the formation of urate crystals. Um, the language used to describe gout is often very confusing. I mean, if you look online, everyone's talking about acid levels in the blood because of the use of the word uric acid. In fact, the correct term for uh, is actually urate in the blood. Um, and, you know, so subsequently people are told, you know, avoid acidic things, it's got nothing to do with that whatsoever. Um, but it's confusing. And, um, you know, even if you look at the essay pathology reference ranges on, you know, the, uh, um, uh, for, for their pathology reports, they use the term uric acid. Um, so that's wrong. <laughs> it's urate. Um, it's also, although the actual principle of treating gout is very simple, you lower the urate, you dissolve the crystals. Over time, it gets better. It actually can be quite complex in the early going. People have a lot of comorbidities. You've got to balance the, the pros and cons of the medications. There could be some increased flares in the short term. And you need to make sure that patients are very well educated as to what what gout is and what to expect when they start this treatment, but also encourage them to keep going because the alternative is that with, you know it, it, it's going to cause some significant damage to their joints most likely. Um, so that increased risk of flares on starting allopurinol. And you have to sort of carefully consider you know, the other medications, other medical conditions. So I put cured in inverted commas because can it be cured? And in most cases, it actually can. And this is the this is the the crime of seeing those you know those X rays of those terribly eroded hands that I showed you earlier. Um, we've known about allopurinol for nearly sixty years. I mean, it, this this can easily be treated. Um, so the key is that we have to get people on allopurinol and progressively increase it to a dose where the urate level is reduced to this appropriate target that I spoke about before. And then those urate crystals will just gradually dissolve and leave the system basically. Um, gout flares, they can initially increase um, and sometimes you've got to weather that storm, particularly during the first 12 months, I have to say. Um, and then they in most will reduce and often a lot earlier than that, but they'll reduce over time and eventually they'll, they'll stop because there's no crystals left. And in those patients who have those lumps of crystals under their skin, those tophi, they will gradually dissolve. So in my clinic, we, we measure those over time and they just progressively go down and eventually disappear. 
Um, and it's a long process. Um, so it's a bit of a project for some people. Um, if we get people earlier, you know, younger, younger patients, you know, they're certainly, um, they've got less crystals, if you like, accumulated in their system and it's an easier job. But, you know, um, you start to see those benefits usually within the first 12 months and it just gets better after that usually for most people. Now, I put cured in inverted commas because um, you still need to start the allopurinol. Obviously, if you stop the allopurinol, the urate level goes back up and the crystals start to um, reform again and you undo all of that work. So I, I never really um, completely lose track of my gout clinic patients at the Royal Adelaide. I still will ask them to come back and see me every year because we we I know that some of them will be convinced by someone that, well, you haven't had a gout flare for like five years now. It's like, well, you can stop your medication. <laughs> so it is a cure, uh, but you do need to sound out of and That is a good thing. It'll keep your urate level low and it shouldn't come back. Now, we might need to make some little adjustments in the in allopurinol dose over time to make sure you're still at target. Maybe you had to be started on a new blood pressure medication. Maybe your kidneys aren't quite as good as they were five years ago. But, you know, it's something that you can make go away and keep it away with proper monitoring. So in those sorts of cases, I usually say you need a blood test every sort of six to 12 months to make sure that urate level is still at target. And this is one of the, um, I'm a ter terrible clinical photographer, so apologize for the quality of the pictures, but this is a young guy in his 30s. This is one of my first patients I saw at the Royal Adelaide um, Gout Clinic. And you can see um, his foot here, this sort of large trophus throwing right angles to his toe there. Uh, and this is his foot now. Um, so that entire lump of crystal there, which is the size of a uh, larger than the golf ball, has completely dissolved. Um, and we've you know, that we expect that to happen over time. Interestingly enough, when I saw him um, uh, last year, he had been convinced to go off of his, <laughs> to reduce his dose of allopurinol without any follow-up blood tests. So yes, you, you do need to stay on the allopurinol. All right, so just to summarize now, I apologize for uh, speaking so long, but um, just to reiterate, gout is um, it's an inflammatory arthritis. It's the most common form of inflammatory arthritis. And at the moment, management in general in the community is suboptimal. Um, but it shouldn't be because we know a lot about gout, uh, as I hope my little historical slideshow has taught you. Um, over the centuries, we've accumulated a lot of knowledge about gout. Uh, we know what it is. We know how to treat it. We have safe, effective medications. Um, in my clinic at the Royal Adelaide, we use what we call a treat to target approach, which is not uncommon for treating rheumatology conditions. We do the same thing with things like rheumatoid arthritis, for example. Uh, in other words, we, we start a treatment like allopurinol and we titrate it upwards until we get to a target and it's important to maintain at that target and it will get consistent results. Um, and over time, and provided someone's being monitored correctly, that can eliminate the symptoms and the signs caused by gout. So at that point, um, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And uh, um, if anyone's got any questions, I'd be happy to do my best to answer them. Perfect. Thank you for that, David. That was uh, fantastic. It was really good just uh, getting your clinical expertise and some of those stories that you've got per personally as well. It's a fantastic presentation. And uh, Good, good jokes in there too. I enjoyed, I enjoyed the gout busters and the Coke one too. They're dad, so, they're dad jokes, yeah. They're, they're dad jokes. <laughs> it's good. Very, very good. So we do we do have a few questions which have come through already previously on signing up. And uh, yep. sorry, sorry to cut towards. I'm sure I apologize for that. But yep. the first one that we had is um, mainly someone kind of concerned about their different conditions and getting relief for their gout attacks. Um, and plantar fasciitis, but they've only got 38% kidney function and type 2 diabetes. Can you kind of speak on that? I guess yeah. not direct, but as a whole? Yeah. So I think the most important thing out of that question is that, yeah, is how we treat gout in patients who have chronic kidney disease. This is really important. Um, as I said before, a lot of the patients in, in my gout clinic have got chronic kidney disease. It's hard to find one that's not. Um, and, uh, a lot of the time people are frightened, doctors are frightened to treat patients with chronic kidney disease. Now, the reasons for that are, um, historical, 
uh, it was recognized that allopurinol in, if you just start a, a spanking great dose in someone with kidney failure, they have high chance they'll have that allopurinol hypersensitivity syndrome and someone get very sick. And so back in the 80s, they came up with this schema of limiting the dose of allopurinol in patients. Have, and there was this whole sort of complex equation that, that people would adhere to um, and effectively put a ceiling on the maximum dose you could get to, the, to with the allopurinol and it wasn't actually effective. Uh, and it's really hard to change because it's, you know, I hate to use the word old wise tales, but a lot of there are a lot when it comes to gout treatment. Um, and so it's a fallacy that you can't treat patients uh, who have gout and chronic kidney disease, even I've got patients on dialysis that we've effectively treated and dissolved all their TOFI. So you just have to start the urate lowering therapy at a, at a very low dose, which is a, a proportional to what their kidney function is. And then just slowly increase it. Look, most people who present with gout, they've been accumulating their crystals for more than 10 years. Um, and there's no, you don't have to be in a huge rush to get rid of them. So just slowly increasing that allopurinol and you can get to that target and, um, and, and eventually dissolve all the crystals in the same way that you would for someone who has normal kidney function. Now, at the other end of the spectrum is treating flares, which also can be a problem for patients with chronic kidney disease because non-steroidal anti-inflammatory things like, you know, naproxen, ibuprofen, neurofen, stuff like that, are contraindicated for, for most people who have, you know, a significant degree of kidney impairment. Um, but, you know, you can use prednisolone or if someone has an, an individual joint involved, um, you can inject it with cortisone. And yes, there are side effects with prednisolone, but as I said before, um, if you use a low dose, in a short period of time, it can be very effective. And of course, if over time, the need for that with the flares will go down. So yes, it does It does actually influence what medications we use in terms of the urate lowering therapy and in the flare medications, but it can be done and it's not a barrier to treatment. That's a really, really good and really thorough answer for that one. We've got another one that's come through. Um, someone's asking the difference between gout and rheumatoid arthritis and do they look differently on x-ray yeah that's a great question and you know as i said it's only sometime sort of about a century ago that 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 actually rheumatologists recognized the difference between them so um they uh, uh, uh the key thing about it is that gout is a crystal arthritis so the way of looking at it is it's a metabolic disease the urate level is high it forms crystals the crystals cause inflammation. The immune system doesn't like the presence of crystals and it, it triggers off a very primitive immune response, which is quite intense. It's the same sort of immune response that you get to the presence of things like bacteria. So it's uh, what we call a crystal arthritis. Um, rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune condition. Okay, It's an autoimmune. So it, the way of looking at that is that your immune system makes billions of decisions about what belongs to you and what's a foreign invader, and sometimes it gets it slightly wrong. And in the case of rheumatoid arthritis, it, the lining of the joint is you know, the victim of friendly fire from the immune system and it gets swollen and inflamed. Now, um, both of them are inflammatory conditions, and that's where the confusion arises, but the cause of the inflammation is different. It's crystals in gout and autoimmune in rheumatoid arthritis. In terms of the x-ray appearances, they both can cause erosions. You'll never see someone with rheumatoid arthritis as, with as bad erosions as you'll see on those pictures that I showed you um, because the inflammation tends not to be quite so intense. Um, and everyone seems to recognize that we need to get on and treat rheumatoid arthritis. <laughs> and uh, so they, you, you'll scarcely find a person with rheumatoid arthritis that's not on some sort of disease modifying therapy to treat it. Um, uh, but there are some technical differences in the appearance of those erosions that you, I, I can look at an x-ray and, and you can see that, yes, this looks like a, a gouty erosion. It tends to have an overhanging edge. It tends to spare the, the joint space. Um, and in the case of rheumatoid arthritis, for example, the erosions tend to be on the, the margins of the joint and they don't tend to be quite as, uh, as, as, uh, as large. Um, so I um, hope that answers that question. But no, yeah. really, really yeah. good. Definitely, definitely answers one. But following on from that, we've got, we've had someone who's asked that they've been diagnosed as rheumatoid arthritis, but they personally think that they've got gout as well. 
and they're struggling to get a diagnosis. They're asking, is it easy to tell the difference between a gout flare and then a flare of rheumatoid arthritis? Yeah, that's a great question. So, so typically gout flares will affect one joint, okay? Rheumatoid arthritis is what we call a polyarthritis. So you usually get multiple joints involved, often the small joints of the hands. It's usually symmetrical. It's usually on both sides. So rheumatoid arthritis might affect the small joints of the hands and the wrists on both sides and the feet, and it can affect other joints as well, but often at least usually those joints. Uh, gout um, is known for causing um, sort of single joints. It can cause multiple joints, but it won't usually present as all the small joints in the hands inflamed at the same time. Um, so it might be a single, like someone's big toe, it might be an ankle, it might be a knee or an elbow. Um, and even if it causes multiple joint involvement, it's usually less than five joints. And that would be very you know, unlucky. <laughs> Perfect. Really, really good answer. So kind of that singular or one or two compared to that mirror that they really see in their RA. I think the other thing to, to recognize is that for rheumatoid arthritis, there are also blood tests you can that you can do. There are autoantibody tests. You can look for things like rheumatoid factor and anti-CCP. That makes the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis very easy if those antibodies are present. Um, and, but some people, in fact, you know, are what we call seronegative rheumatoid arthritis, and they lack those autoantibodies. And yes, I have occasionally come across someone who's been diagnosed as having a seronegative inflammatory arthritis, treated like a rheumatoid arthritis, turns out they actually had gout. Or they can both occur at the same time, with gout being, of course, the much more common uh, condition um, by a factor of 10, at least. Really, really good answer for it. We've had someone ask about um, diet, and they're asking about the importance of drinking water. Um, that's their first question. And a follow-up from that one that said, at what point is it really important to refer to a rheumatologist like yourself? Right. Okay. So in terms of drinking water, it's not like a direct cause. Um, uh, it, it's important to be well hydrated. If someone gets dehydrated, that can often lead to a flare. It's not going to actually cause the gout, you know, the crystals in the first place. But dehydration can be the precipitant of a flare. Um, now, I don't know if anyone's done a study on that, but just through observation and you know, hearing people talk about the onset of their flares, that's a very common phenomenon. So I think it's important to be well, well hydrated for sure. You know, the classic story is someone pushing a lawnmower on a hot day, getting dehydrated and pushing off on their big toes. So a bit of trauma doesn't hurt and triggering off a flare as well. And then, you know, two o'clock the next morning, waking up with a, with a flare in the big toe, the, the pedagra phenomenon. And so I think hydration is important, but it's not, it's not per se a cause of the underlying cause of the gout itself. Um, and so in, in terms of referral to a rheumatologist, look, it's, um, that's a tricky one because it's, when you think about it, if we're talking about nearly one in 10 men in South Australia, there's simply not enough rheumatologists to see all those patients. Um, I have perhaps 200 patients in my cohort uh, total uh, at the Rod Adelaide. That is just like a tiny fraction and, and often they're really bad cases. Um, I think it's difficult because it's there's, there's patient factors and there's, there's doctor factors as well. You know, it's hard to get in to see your GP. You might only go and see them when you have a flare and, you know, you get treated for the flare, the flare's over and you think, well, I feel fine now. So what, what am I doing this for? Why am I going back? Am I having that follow-up discussion with my GP about starting treatment? Um, so I think it, you know, often you'll find this varies. It's, it's a really difficult field, uh, general practice, because you have to cover so many, so many different specialties. Um, and some some general practitioners are expert in treating gout, and and some maybe not so much. Um, I think if uh, the best thing to do is, is to ask, you know, I've, I've had this flare, for example, you present for the first time, what can I do to, 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 to stop this from happening? And if they're not confident, well, can you refer me to a rheumatologist? Um, so we're obviously happy to see anyone at the <laughs> shameless plug. We're happy to see anyone at the, at the gout clinic at the road. <laughs> like we take all comers. <laughs> you don't have to be in the catchment area. So, 
Um, it's just the bad parking. But other than that, we're ha we're happy to see anyone. But but obviously, uh, I, I, from a future perspective, um, we are we're we're trying to apply a treat to target approach uh, to the to the management of gout. Uh, but we recognise that you know um, we need to have the the GPs on board. I've spoken to some GP groups who are keen to perhaps set up a study where we kind of implement that sort of protocol with the GPs and then they can contact me for example if they if, if they need some further specialist advice but that basic protocol that I spoke about you know it, it, it's simple enough but people need a plan that's that's I guess the short answer yeah so I've probably got a little bit of time just for one one more question together um, and then for everyone else I'll email out some answers um, it's really about management of those topies. So one person's asked that um, if you're meant to drain them if they're leaking, and then the other person's just asking um, mainly just about wound care with the alteration of them. Do you, have, do you oh, have time to go through those? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I think this is really important. Thank you for asking that question, whoever it was. Uh, try not to traumatise the toe fire, okay? Uh, sometimes because the skin is often stretch very tight over them. It's not your fault. You'll brush it on something, it will become ulcerated. Now, as I said before, the crystals, they're very offensive to the immune system, which means that the wound over the top of those tophi will heal very slowly. You, if you have an ulcerated tophus, then uh, you need to see your GP and the practice nurse and have it dressed correctly and monitored. And over time, it should heal. Um, but it's important that you get appropriate wound care. Sometimes like that horrendous picture of the finger that I showed you, um, you know, it can get infected um, and that can, that can be very serious. People lose fingers and toes. And so following on from that, no, you should never let anyone deliberately try and drain stuff out of it, okay? Now, we have had some stories of people, um, doctors, <laughs> actually trying to express the sort of the the the, the, the tophus material the tophaceous material out do not let someone do that to you um because it will just keep draining and it, it will be slow to heal and you know it will take a while but we can dissolve it away with the medications and it will stay away so some people get sent off to a surgeon they have it cut off and then surprise surprise it grows back um so it should be dissolved. There are some exceptions to that. And I didn't show you all the graphic pictures of, of, of you know, side effects of tofu. But look, there are some cases, like we had a patient that had a tofus on the back of the hand and eroded through the tendons. Now that tofus had to be removed. So that required a you know, surgery to remove it. And that is absolutely fine. But if that tofus is sitting there, the best thing is to get the urate lowering therapy with allopurinol, dissolve the crystals. They'll be gone forever. You don't have to do that. That's a really, really good answer to end it on. So it's really getting to see the right doctor, get on the right medication, and then just to make sure you've got the right, right wound care for the time being. Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. Well, David, thank you so much for tonight. It was a wonderful presentation and, and full of full of very fun bits, I think, for a, for a presentation on GAO. I really appreciate it. Um, and I thank everyone for coming along as well. Um, monthly webinars, we've always got experts like David who present, so we're really, really lucky here. Um, again, I want to thank the Country SAPHN for the funding of this webinar, and I hope you all enjoy the rest of your night.